Good day. As I am making this programme, voting in the United States has been underway for some time in the midterm elections. Um, most probably, by the time this programme goes up, um, I suspect on uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, on Wednesday, um, you will have the results. At this moment in time, I don't, but all the predictions, all the forecasts speak of significant Republican gains and a virtual certainty that the Republicans will regain control of the House of Representatives, with also suggestions that they may also gain control of the Senate as well. Once I know what these results are, I will be able to discuss them in much more detail. But I will say this, as of this moment in time, it does look as if the Republicans are expected to do well. And there seems to be a great deal of demoralisation on the part of the Democrats um, as the results start to work their way through. Um, no doubt we will be doing on the Duran a detailed analysis of these results probably early next week with um, our friend Robert Barnes and if you want you know a full carefully considered carefully judged unpacked analysis of the results it's to the Duran that you should go. Um, Alex uh, Christoforo and I will be joined by Robert Barnes and we will no doubt be discussing these election results in great detail. In the meantime, I'm going to do what I always do now and have been doing for a very long time, which is I'm going to be primarily talking about the Ukrainian situation and where we are. And all the news, uh, all the media internationally, globally, are now discussing the possible start of negotiations between Russia and uh, um, possibly Ukraine or perhaps the United States. But anyway, some sort of discussions about um, the diplomatic initiative that the Biden administration is supposedly making and the actions of the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan. I would say that there is massive disagreement and uh, uh, an argument about how serious this diplomatic initiative actually is. And I'm also going to say that the Russian media has up to now shown a sort of solid, stony indifference to it. The Russians, of course, have commented on some of this. They don't appear to be taking the American initiative terribly seriously, which doesn't surprise me. But before I get into all of that, I'm going to do briefly what I traditionally do, which is look at the situation on the battlefronts in Ukraine. And here the answer is that though the situation has been broadly stable over the last couple of hours, so far as I can judge, things have not gone terribly well for Ukraine. There were more Ukrainian attacks in Kherson region. They all failed. Kirill Stremusov, the deputy governor of Kherson region, has also said that the front lines are holding and that the Ukrainians are making no real, um, are making no ground at all there, but are instead suffering heavy losses as a result of the various attacks that they try to launch. We've had a great deal more information about the Pavlovka situation. This is the situation near the town of Vugladar, where the Russians launched an attack uh, some weeks ago. That attack has got bogged down in the difficult uh, conditions with heavy fighting in the northern part of the village of Pavlivka, of Pavlovka, the part of the village which is closest to the important a strategically important town of Vugladar. Now, there have been lots of reports, lots of stories that the Russians have suffered very heavy losses there. There have even been some stories that the Russians have been pulled back out of Pavlovka, or Pavlovka. I'm going to call it Pavlovka in this program. And this 
caused the governor of Primorye region in Russia, this is the governor of a region where one of the major military units, Russian military units, which are carrying out this attack towards Vugladar, um, at an, it's a naval infantry or marine brigade. Anyway, this governor anxiously contacted the defense ministry to find out, the Russian defense ministry, to find out what was actually going on and whether the reports of very, very heavy Russian casualties were true. And the Russian authorities, the Russian military authorities, including, by the way, it seems, the commander of this brigade, who apparently spoke on the telephone to the governor of the Primoria region, the Russian military authorities have um, given assurances that the tale of heavy, massive losses by the Russian forces in Pavlivka are grossly exaggerated. They say that only 1% of the attacking force were killed and only 7% were wounded and most of those who were wounded were wounded very lightly and mostly they've been able to actually rejoin their unit and are once more engaging in the battle. So that suggests, at least to me, that um, to the extent that most of these people were indeed wounded, they were wounded by shrapnel and uh, things of that kind, rather than actually hit by bullets or shells or anything of that kind. So um, that's what the Russian military are saying. Now, the trouble is, of course, 1% of what size of force? These are the numbers of troops who are actually supposedly killed in action. And it's been suggested by some people that a uh, ma marine brigade would number around 3,300 men in total, and that 1% uh, of that is 33. <laughs> so that, um, and if you um, add another 7%, you get a figure of around 260, which corresponds supposedly fairly closely to the number of 300 men that have probably been, that have been, uh, uh, as the total casualties in this fight, that have been circulating in various parts of the Russian internet. Well, as has been pointed out by one of the most astute commentators of, um, the war, Russian commentators of the war, Gleb Bazov. This is almost certainly wrong. It's most unlikely that the Marine Brigade that has been deployed in Pavlovka is at full strength. By the way, can I just say again, this isn't something I have uh, uh, um, I have was discussed many times. I don't have vast experience on military matters, but in my experience, military units when they go into battle never include every single person who is involved, uh, who is part of those military units. There's always people who are on leave, people who are don't play direct military roles, people who are in base areas, people who are doing all sorts of things, people who are ill or otherwise indisposed or wounded. I mean, it'd be most unusual for more than, say, half a force to be thrown into battle at any one particular time. How do I know that? I know that because decades ago I was part of an advice uh, clinic in Woolwich giving advice to British soldiers and I remember being told this by one of them in connection with um, I think it was one of the Iraq wars. So Glad Bazov is undoubtedly right. It's inconceivable that the entire brigade of 3,300 men were sent into battle, presumably including cooks and support staff and bands, if they have one, um, um, into battle in Pavlovka. You, you would be looking at perhaps um, half that number um, at most. And if one uses the figures, extrapolates from the Russian figures, the figures that the Russian Defence Ministry is giving, well, that would suggest 10 to 20 people killed 
and perhaps a hundred wounded. And Bazov says that these are much more plausible figures than the figures we've been hearing coming from some of the people <laughs> that have been feverishly talking up 300 dead and wounded as a result of the battle. Now, 10 to 20 dead and 100 wounded suggests a very fierce and very difficult battle indeed. But I would say, and I would repeat this point, it's significantly less than the level of casualties that Ukraine routinely experiences, again, if you accept Russian figures as being correct, which most people who followed this war closely, um, apart from those who are openly on Ukraine's side, most people who've looked at this conflict generally do. I do. And, you know, one reads about Ukrainian attacks, brigade sent into battle in one place, an advance in Kherson region or attempted advance, and it's not unusual to read then Russian claims that these units have suffered losses of 30, 50, 100, or 200 men, much higher than these figures that the Russian military seem to be, or at least Gleb Bavzov says, that the Russian military are reporting for the Battle of Pavlovka. Now, of course, all of this does assume that those Russian claims about Ukrainian casualties are true. But as I've said in the past, there is actually from time to time some Ukrainian corroboration for them, and even corroboration that has appeared occasionally in the British, in the Western media. They've reported about very heavy losses of Ukrainian forces in a way that seems to bear out the Russian figures. So whilst 10, 20, even 30 Russian soldiers killed in one battle is a lot, it's perhaps not so much looked at from the Ukrainian side. Now, over the last few hours, we've been hearing about renewed Russian attacks on Vugladar. So it looks as if that offensive, even if it's been slowed down, has not been abandoned. The Russians seem to be adjusting to the increased Ukrainian resistance and they are making, it seems, or at least they're trying to make progress. So it looks as if the battle of, for Vugladar, for Pavlovka, is far from ended and that the Russians haven't given up and the comments that were sent to the governor of Primoria region, including by the actual commander of the brigade, they all seem to suggest that the Russians are still hoping to achieve some positive outcome in this battle. Now, what's going on in Uvugladar and Pavlovka is to some extent in doubt. We have heard more information about things that have been going on in other places. And in particular, there's been one piece of confirmed news, and it is important, which is that the authorities of the Donetsk People's Republic, which of course considers itself now to be incorporated in Russia, that the authorities of the Donetsk People's Republic have now formally confirmed that all Ukrainian forces have been cleared entirely from the very large area of Donetsk Airport and have been pushed fully away from Donetsk Airport, which is now firmly under the control of the Donetsk People, People's Republic and its forces, and by extension, obviously, by the Russians. Now, this is an important battle. It's been arguably the single longest battle of the whole war. It's been waged ever since 2014. There's been fighting for Donetsk Airport. I've said this is a huge territory underway um, ever since 20, the 2014 fighting. There was a major uptick in the fighting in 
for Donetsk Airport in 2015, when against bitter Ukrainian resistance, the Donbass militia was able to capture the main airport buildings. But the Ukrainians continued to control large areas of the airport thereafter, and they fortified their positions there. And this battle has now finally ended with the Donetsk forces, the Russian forces, finally in full, undisputed, unchallenged control of the entire territory of the airport, which, as I said, covers an enormous area. Now, yesterday or the day before yesterday, there were also reports that Russian troops have reached the center of Marinka, one of the villages around Donetsk city, which had been heavily fortified by Ukraine and which is at the other end of the supply routes that run from Vugledar. There's been no further information about this, but there's also been but there has, by contrast, been more scattered information about the situation in Bakhmut. Now, this is Bakhmut is a very difficult battle to read because I get the sense that both sides are keeping a very tight control of the information that comes out of Bakhmut, probably because the battle that's been fought over Bakhmut is, has been on such a very big scale. But anyway, we're now getting video footage. This is all from Ukrainian sources, which so show or purport to show Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut city, in the center of Bakhmut city. And as a number of people are pointing out, these soldiers seem to be um, exposed to fire, including small arms fire, which appears to confirm some reports that the Wagner organization troops and other Russian troops have actually broken into the center of Bakhmut city and may have done so some time ago and that fighting is taking place there. I say that because most of the reports from the Russian side at least still seem to focus on battles for suburban areas of Bakhmut city, but we do get reports from time to time that the Russians are pressing in on Bakhmut city and that they're closing in on it from three different directions. And this video footage and some of the reports one is hearing, they, they seem to confirm this fact. So it's difficult to know what to make of this, but the video footage does seem to be real. It does seem to show the Ukrainian troops looking concerned and under considerable pressure. And there are also other reports that the Ukrainians are now hurriedly trying to build another line of defense east of Bakhmut city at a place called Chazov Yar, all of which appears to imply that the battle for Bakhmut is indeed going very badly for Ukraine, as Zelensky essentially admitted about two weeks ago, and that it doesn't begin to look as if Bakhmut city might indeed be about to fall. Well, we'll just have to see. But as I said, there is now an accumulation of evidence which suggests that the situation of the Ukrainians in Bakhmut is bad and of the Russians is better. Better even, perhaps, than some Russian commentators are admitting. So it's a confused picture, but we don't really know very much. Anyway, in the meantime, even as the fighting goes on, even as the missile and drone strikes across Ukraine continue, even as we get more news about power shortages in parts of the Ukrainian energy system, even as that continues, we have this swirling reports now about diplomatic initiatives and about negotiations. And what was a little speculative before in my previous two videos, I think is now universally acknowledged. We now have a, had a report in La Repubblica 
an Italian newspaper, important Italian newspaper, which also says that the United States is looking to set up some kind of negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. Though, again, La Repubblica now says it straightforwardly that the United States hopes that these negotiations will begin after Kherson is recaptured, Kherson city is recaptured by Ukraine. And we've also heard further reports that um, the Vatican, the Vatican City, is offering itself as a neutral ground for the, Ukra for the Russians and the Ukrainians to negotiate. And there's been lots of further speculations. And we've had some theories about all of this from various sides. So there's been a suggestion made that the United States is not being honest about this, that it doesn't really intend to conduct negotiations, that it's this is all a ruse to try to fool its allies in Europe, who are supposedly getting stressed about the war, that in fact the United States is now looking for a negotiated settlement in order to keep its European allies on side. I get to say straight away that I disagree with this theory. I think that so far there is no sign that the major European governments are um, weakening in their support for Ukraine, at least verbally speaking, or that they're calling for negotiations. I think, on the contrary, what is more likely to cause European governments to start having serious doubts and to start wobbling in their support for Ukraine is if they get hints that the United States is looking for a diplomatic way out. At that point, some of the people who probably have private doubts about this Ukrainian venture are more likely to find the courage to come out and speak openly and say that this has all been a hideous mistake and that a negotiated settlement is now essential than would be the case if, on the contrary, the United States was saying that it's not interested in negotiations. That's entirely a matter for Ukraine to sort out. So I don't think that this ploy, if it is a ploy, this, this um, shall we say, this sudden shift on the part of the Biden administration towards seeking negotiations, I don't think it's intended to hold Europe in line. I think that's uh, a misreading of the situation. That's my own view and a misunderstanding of the dynamics of decision making by European governments. But others, well, there's lots of speculations, but what we can say, I think, with some confidence is that the Ukrainians themselves are not happy. There, were, there was one report which I've seen, which I discount entirely, which is that Zelensky himself is now apparently giving thought to working out a negotiating position with the Russians in which Ukraine surrenders the whole of the southeast of Ukraine, including, the, including Odessa, by the way, in order to secure peace, but that the Russians guarantee his position that he remains in power. I don't believe Zelensky is in any position to agree to anything like that. But anyway, um, if you disregard that, uh, one report, all the indications are that the Ukrainians are very unhappy about now being asked to negotiate. There's one of um, Zelensky's um, aides, a person called Podolyak, has now said that Ukraine is not going to negotiate, that it's going to continue the war until every inch of Ukrainian territory, including Crimea, is recovered. That is the orthodox position Ukraine is adopting. Maybe it sounds a bit defiant to me when made at this time, but it does seem, again, to restate the Ukrainian position. And perhaps more importantly, Zelensky has now suddenly proposed bills to the Ukrainian parliament 
calling for martial law, apparently, and general mobilization. That is presumably a call up of everybody capable of fighting into the Ukrainian armed forces. Something which, as I've said previously, I doubt that Ukraine can achieve. And I doubt also that the Ukrainian military can absorb. There's also, by the way, reports that Zelensky is once again thinking of sacking General Zeluzhny and appointing a new general who will presumably obey these kind of orders. I have to say, this is all looking very confused, but it does seem intended on the Ukrainian side to shut down any discussion of negotiations. Meanwhile, the United States government, that is to say the Biden administration, has said, well, actually, yes, it's correct. We are in touch with the Russians. We are having contacts with them, but it's not about trying to cut out Ukraine, not about trying to push Ukraine into negotiations. It's all about strategic stability, trying to prevent the war expanding, trying to prevent escalation, and also trying to do something about the enormous dangers posed by nuclear weapons, perhaps by getting arms limitation talks underway again. Uh, um, I have to say that if you believe any of that, then I have a bridge to sell you. I mean, it is inconceivable that the United States would be talking to the Russians about these sort of topics and not be discussing the situation in Ukraine. Anyway, so there we are. It's all very confused and very muddled. And in the meantime, looming on the horizon is the G20 meeting in Bali. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we were hearing talk that the State Department was working uh, round the clock to make sure that if there was if Putin did come to the G20 meeting in Bali, there would be no occasion upon which Biden himself met him. Now we're getting some reports in some places that in fact Biden and Putin are actually going to have a meeting in Bali. And Zelensky, for his part, has been saying if Putin goes to Bali, well, he won't go himself, and now he's reversed his position. Well, he's not entirely reversed his position. He's saying, well, he might actually participate in talks in, in, in what goes on in Bali at the G20 summit. After all, it's all, as I said, incredibly confusing and very difficult to read. But one does get the sense that some kind of diplomatic moves are underway, that the Ukrainians aren't happy, and that the United States, or at least the Biden administration, is, is indeed trying to get some kind of talks underway. I've discussed the possible reasons in previous videos, but that it's finding it very difficult to get the Ukrainians on side. By the way, that is exactly the same pattern as has happened in previous wars, both in the Vietnam War in the 1960s and 1970s and in the war in, the Af in Afghanistan, which has just ended, the United States found that after having basically told its erstwhile ally, in the first case South Vietnam, in the second case Afghanistan, that it must never talk to the other side and that it must wage this war until victory, when it reversed its position and decided that it wished talks to begin after all, it found that its allies or protégés, the South Vietnamese and the Afghans, when the Afghan government were not keen on engaging in those talks at all. In both cases, one gets the sense that having been led into a war, the South Vietnamese and the Afghans felt extremely betrayed by this sudden reversal in the US position. And of course, in the case of Ukraine, 
and the current Ukrainian government. If those feelings of betrayal do exist, they will almost certainly be especially strong and frankly justified, given that Ukraine had actually almost agreed a settlement with Russia during the talks in Istanbul on the 29th of March. There was apparently even a draft agreement ready for initialing. Uh, and of course, it was Britain and the United States that talked the Ukrainians out of that diplomatic path they were following and caused the Ukrainians to completely reverse course and to take back all the concessions which they had made. And of course, the Ukrainians will be furious that if they're now being told that they should sit down and negotiate with the Russians months after, uh, months after that event in Istanbul, after tens upon tens of thousands of Ukrainians have died in the fighting, perhaps hundreds of thousands, more than a hundred thousand, and after more territory has been lost, more cities like Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, Bakhmut, soon perhaps, Mariupol, after all of these places have been lost, and Ukrainians will understandably be very, very angry if they find themselves being told by the Americans to reverse course. And you can understand why the Ukrainians might now be taking steps, like the ones I've just been talking about, the gen announcements of general mobilization of martial law and all of that, to try to make it clear that they are not interested in talks at the present time. As for the Russians, I'm going to say this straightforwardly. The Russians have said repeatedly, yes, they're prepared to talk with the United States, but they will want deals with the United States and they will also want negotiations with Ukraine. And this time they will not, I think, agree to anything remotely approximating to a Minsk II type settlement. And I suspect that the Russians, in fact, all the indications are that the Russians, if talks do resume, are going to tell the United States that, yes, we're willing to sort out this conflict in Ukraine, but on the condition that the United States revisits the treaties, the draft treaties we sent to the United States in December last year. The treaties about the fact that there should be no further extension of NATO and that all NATO military infrastructure should be withdrawn back to the territory of Germany, to the 99, NATO's 1998 borders. So I think if the United States believes that an, a negotiation to end this conflict is going to be at all easy, I think they're going to be disappointed. I think they're going to find that the negotiations are going to be every bit as grueling and as tough as the negotiations which um, led to the American withdrawals from Vietnam and Afghanistan with respectively the North Vietnamese and the Afghans. I think that for the Russians, for the Russian leadership, it can be no, no less because from the Russian point of view, after all that has happened, Russian public opinion would insist upon the kind of hard line that I've just been talking about. And the other people who will probably feel deeply troubled by a negotiating process of this kind are, of course, the British, and the Europeans, who have taken extraordinary steps to stop oil and gas imports from Russia, impose extraordinary sanctions upon Russia, and who would surely feel, if negotiations like this happened, that the ground had been cut 
away from under their feet. Anyway, that's where we are at the moment. I'm not convinced any sort of negotiations are going to take place. All the indications that I can see are that the Russians are listening to what the Americans say, saying, you know, all right, fine, if you want to talk, talk. But ultimately, this conflict is now with Ukraine. It's Ukraine that must sit down and negotiate with us. At the moment, the Ukrainians show no sign of doing so. If you want to get the Ukrainians to talk, it's easy. All you need to do is switch off aid to Ukraine. We are not interested in anything else. And if you want to talk about strategic stability, well, as I said, you must talk about the treaties, the two draft treaties that we proposed to you last year and which you dismissed in what was essentially summary fashion, something which the United States won't want to listen to. And as I said, for Zelensky and the people around him, they must calculate that if they start negotiations along the kind of lines that we're talking about, their position within Ukraine itself is going to become impossible. And for that reason, again, I don't expect them to agree to negotiations. This looks to me, as I said previously in previous programmes, like the administration trying to wriggle out of a trap that it has caught itself in as it realises that with Republican control of Congress and with the economic situation deteriorating and with Ukraine's military position deteriorating as well, it's got to find some way of extricating itself from a crisis that is not evolving in the way that it perhaps initially expected. The result is overcomplicated diplomatic actions which I suspect will lead nowhere. But I remain an observer. We shall see. And in the meantime, we shall see whether the Republicans do indeed gain the unequivocal victory in the midterms that so many expect and what effect that has on the diplomatic process. So a bad day for Ukraine on the military fronts a confusing day in terms of the diplomacy. Um, conflict far from resolved. I suspect that it will continue and that it will continue until either one or two things happen. Either the Russians achieve victory, a military victory and impose terms, or someone in the United States probably someone outside the administration, possibly someone in Congress, has the force and authority to call a final stop to American aid. Now, aid to Ukraine. Well, we will see what happens, and one way or the other, I will continue to talk about all of this, and I will keep you all informed of my views. Well, thank you again for joining me today for this program. Uh, as I said, more from me soon. I'm still out of London in the English regions, which makes broadcast publishing of these videos a bit erratic. I can only apologise for that. And um, I look forward to speaking to you again in any event. And remember, you can find us on other platforms, Locals, Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, um, telegram and of course we're now also on rockfin and you can also find us you can also support our work short, i'm sorry to say by patreon and subscribe star and by going to our shop and buying all the amazing things that you will find there and last but not least if you've liked this video please remember to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel well thank you for joining me again today more from me soon